Okay. All right. We're back after a long weekend. A long weekend. <laughs> a long and fun weekend. It was so great. Allie threw me the best bridal shower of all time. <laughs> yeah, you missed out on the one and only. If you don't even throw a bridal shower for anyone you ever know ever again. That was it. That was the one. Oh, it was so much fun. So, but I definitely got too drunk. Um, <laughs> but not till the end of the night. It's not, not like till the you end were of the drunk night. Drunk with like no, 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 grandma around. No, I was very nice and like just a little tipsy when my grandparents were around. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and I just let it all fall apart at the end. Um, I just remember we took a walk and then mm-hmm. Casey and I just fell asleep in the grass, like <laughs> around the corner from your house, like not in your lawn, no, nope. in someone else's lawn. <laughs> it, was a, it was a fun night. <laughs> It was great, and I'm really excited because the wedding is coming up, and I'm absolutely freaking out, but it's going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> but we're not here to talk about weddings yet. No, we're here to talk about history. On the rock With Katie. And Allie. This is a podcast where we talk about famous women in history. We talk about good women and bad women and fictional women and non-fictional women from all times and places because women have nuance. <laughs> but keep in mind, we are drinking the entire time. And we're not historians, Mm -mm. but we're good at Googling, (laughs) we're good at cocktails, and we're good at saying sorry when we mess things up. (laughs) Yes, we do routinely. Really good at it. (laughs) Um, But I'm really excited to dive into this week because it's going to be a fun pair of people. I think so too. Yeah. And I think last week, I was listening to last week's episode and it was funnier than I remember. (laughs) (laughs) It was really funny. I liked it. (sighs) I love it. Well, I hope that happens again this week. (laughs) Yeah, I hope so too. You're busy though. Um, You know, you're not listening. You're listening to a backlog of podcasts right now. And ours is just like one in a million that you're trying to get through. So you you have us on double time. Mm -hmm. So you don't have time to stop and Google what these women look like. No, you just really don't have the time. So we're going to describe them for you. So you can get a picture in your head while we're telling their story. We're going to get a little... Physical, physical. Allie, who are you doing and what does she look like? I am doing the amazing Senator, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Tammy (laughs) Duckworth. She is a Thai American woman with shoulder length dark hair. She has a round face with these beautiful, like puffy cheeks. Mm -hmm. You'll typically see her wearing a professional suit like you would be wearing on the floor of the Congress. But then sometimes if you look at old pictures, you'll see her in military gear. But Tammy is extraordinarily recognizable because she is living with a disability so often you will see her in a wheelchair or walking with a cane because she has two prosthetic limbs two Two. oh my god yeah okay so who are you doing and what does she look like I am doing Artemis the Huntress. So Artemis is a tall, strong Grecian goddess who is typically pictured with dark hair that's long and flowing sometimes up sometimes down sharp features piercing eyes she's usually wearing a short tunic style dress that's flowy but very functional she has sandals that lace all the way up to to her knees uh very useful for running through the forest (laughs) uh she is adorned with the symbols of the crescent moon and is almost always carrying a bow and arrow and being accompanied by hounds and deer But most importantly, in almost every photo, she is in, or not photo, you know, portrait, statue, whatever. She is in motion because this girl likes to move. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what she looked like. (laughs) That's great. I love that. You want to tell me what I'm drinking? This is going to be a fun pair to compare. I'm very excited. Yeah. Um, So I was looking up and I found, because usually I feel like when we do like Greek people, you know, we use a lot of like ouzo and like light lemony stuff. And then I found a cocktail called the Huntsman and I loved the look of it. It felt like something you would drink at like Gaston's Tavern. Mm. And I was like, that is perfect for this Huntress. So this well, like is- the Huntsman's the guy from um, Snow White, right? Yes. The mm-hmm. Cutter Heart Out guy. Mm-hmm. So this is called the Huntress. It is an ounce and a half of bourbon, an ounce of sweet vermouth, uh, three fourths of an ounce of coffee liqueur, a half an ounce of rosemary simple syrup. And you top the whole thing. I'm oh, not rosemary. I'm sorry. Lavender. Lavender simple syrup. And then you top the whole thing off with stout beer 
and you garnish with a sprig of lavender. Wow. Cheers. That's a super intense ingredients barrel. Mm. Oh, the lavender definitely comes through, but mm-hmm. it's not too strong. Floral no. can sometimes be way too strong. I don't even taste the Guinness. That's pretty impressive. I, I can't believe I don't because I put like a good bit in there. I can't believe like, it's not Guinness. <laughs> <laughs> mm. But I really like it. It's like kind of creamy too. I, like, yeah. I don't taste the bur. I think the bourbon is making the creamy flavor. Yeah. But everything else is canceling out the the like harsher taste of the bourbon. I also like I'm not even tasting the coffee that much. No. <laughs> This is very weird, but weird. I, I love Everything's it. hidden in the forest. Ah, <laughs> this is great. All right. So what do you know about Artemis? Okay. Artemis is one of the three virgin goddesses, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, Artemis is a huntress. Mm-hmm. She's got a crew of female friends, followers, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, she, this guy was peeping on them in the woods, and she shot an arrow at him. For show, for show. Yeah, turned him into a deer or something. Or maybe they're, yeah. He's a deer. They're hunting him, Mm -hmm. perhaps. Um, And she's one of the big name female goddesses. There's like a lot of female goddesses. But like in terms of Greek mythology, it's like her, Athena, um, Aphrodite, and Persephone. Mm -hmm. And there's like, you know, a few other here and there. But those are like the ones that are so fun to yes. talk about yeah and uh, that's the whole thing with this story to keep in mind when i'm telling it is like there are so many stories about artemis and i wanted to get the hits in there but there are a lot of things like that just i don't know that like there are a lot of different versions of every one of these stories too so if like i didn't include your favorite artemis anecdote like i apologize i don't even think i talk about the trojan war and i know she did something with it but <laughs> there's just too many like tellings and retellings yeah because and- now even we're into the era where like rick riordan like has retold them all again right like yeah. modern day yeah so you're like i don't even know who's who anymore exactly so i'm just gonna go through some of my favorite stories some of her personality traits and whatnot um but yeah so i apologize if i don't get to your favorite artemis thing but but shout it out to us and we'll put it on yeah, our, inst- let our us know. socials yeah <laughs> we'll put the story up okay artemis the huntress is yet another one of zeus's children <laughs> But unlike many of the other Greek characters, this time all sources agree that her mother was Leto. I feel like sometimes it's like, oh, some people say it was Hera. Some people say it was, you know, this person. But like everyone agrees Leto is her mother. She is a Titaness who was unfortunately not Zeus's wife, but yet another <laughs> mistress. We know he loves a mistress. I mean, he's and also the worst. raping women. <laughs> um, so when Hera, who was Zeus's wife, found out that Zeus had impregnated the Leto, she flipped out and she cursed her. She said Leto was not allowed to give birth on any land or any place under the sun. <laughs> oh and so lita goes into labor uh and she's just walking around for days while in tremendous pain trying to find a spot to birth her children finally zeus is like fine i'll help you out so he put her on the island of delos and then floated it above the ocean a little bit of a loophole (laughs) maybe just call hades he could help i feel like he could um and then he also provided an olive tree um over her so that she wouldn't be in the sun so getting through those loopholes uh (laughs) interesting because olives are uh athena's thing i know and she's zeus's daughter as well well that's saying the olive tree only came up in a couple of stories it's not in all of them because also there's one where they're like oh like she got around it by balancing herself on an olive branch like Nice. I don't know. Nice. Um, so she gave birth to two beautiful twins, Artemis and Apollo. Uh, according to legend, when Artemis was born, she wasted no time in growing up. And she was so mature by the time her twin brother was born, she acted as her own mother's midwife, mm-hmm. helping little Apollo come into the world. Some say she aged to six years old, and some say she was only nine days old. <laughs> But either way, this is very typical Artemis behavior. She knew exactly what she wanted in life, and she wasted no time in going after it. After it, So one day, she went to her father, Zeus, and she sat on his lap, and she said, I want six things from you. You're the most powerful man in the universe, and I am asking you for six things. 
What a power move. I know. Six now, and that's it. Or yeah. Or does she ask again in the future? No. Okay. This is it. Six forever. Some right? people say ten, but I think this list of six sums it up really nicely. If we could nip the Santa Claus thing in the bit, but <laughs> yeah. <with> that, <laughs> in ten things ever. So she goes to Zeus, and she goes, I want the mountainous areas, the forests, as my domain. I want to never marry, and I want to remain a virgin forever. I want bows and arrows created by the Cyclops and a hunting tunic to wear. I want to have more names than Apollo, my brother. <laughs> and then she says, I want 60 nymphs as attendants for, and I want hounds. And I want to bring light into the world. Mm. So there's a couple of those that are like more than one thing, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. She's definitely asking for several, but I, I always heard that like the virgin thing came from like, when she was born, she immediately had to turn and watch her brother be born. Mm-hmm. So it was like scarring as a, oh, yes. as a she child. Was her own mother's midwife. I yeah. think she was like, wow, that looks horrible. I want nothing to do with that. Like, yeah. no, thank you. Contraceptives are not available. In exactly. <laughs> uh, and Zeus just loved her tenacity and she was just so darn cute. So he granted his daughter's wishes with the caveat that she had to retrieve the gifts herself. So this leads us into her teen and young adult years, which she spent traveling and seeking out her treasures. She obtained her silver bow and golden arrows from the Isle of Lipara, where Hephaestus and the Cyclops worked. Now, I don't know if it's the Cyclops or Cyclopes. I've heard it. uh, I heard it two different ways. I think it's the Cyclops. I would think so. And Hephaestus is the one that's banging on the metal, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, So she got her bows and arrows. Then she visited Pan, the god of the forest, who gave her seven female and six male hounds. Then she captured six golden horned deer to pull her chariot. And Artemis just went to the forest, again, her domain, and practiced archery first by shooting at trees. And then she moved on to wild game. Uh, And then it wasn't difficult to get like a dope ass crew of like lady nymphs. (laughs) I mean, once you've got, you know, the seven rings to share. Oh, yeah. She's yeah. got a solid entourage. But that's the thing. She wanted to get, like, her, like, swag stuff, you mm. know? Like, she wanted to get her chariots and her bows and her hounds. And then she's like, come and join my posse. And these ladies are like, woo, yeah. Well, you got to have the power first. You do. Yeah. <laughs> you don't need people to see you weak before you get them on your team. Exactly. <gasps> double the hounds, double the power. <laughs> um. <laughs> double the pleasure. <laughs> so... Now she is like kind of at her full power and she's presiding over a lot. So let's break it down. She is the goddess of wilderness, hunting, fishing, animals, but she's also the goddess of chastity, women's health, childbirth, nursing, and maiden activities. Whatever that means. (laughs) Braiding hair. Sure. She's the goddess of French braids. (laughs) She loves a plait. Um, (laughs) This is why it's also fitting that she is the goddess of the moon. I feel like moons are much more connected to like menstruation and women's cycles and things like that. I feel like the moon is very feminine and and, and very witchcrafty. Yes. And her twin brother Apollo is the god of the sun. And his chariot's like fire too, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. He's... He's wild. He's such a bro. <laughs> He's such a bro. And I think that this is one of the most interesting aspects of Artemis is that she represents kind of the whole cycle of life. She provides over the creation of new life, you know, like childbirth, newborn. Some say she's also also the goddess of lactation and she helps protect newborn children and newborn animals. But she has no problem in taking mature life away. She kills many men, many animals, some women. Like, she's just kind of beginning to end. She's like, yeah, birth happens and death happens. And, like, they can exist at the same time. Yeah, I mean, just true. Sustainable like, murder. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's interesting because this meant that, like, people worshipped her in a lot of different ways. So, like, men would make blood sacrifices to her while battle, while simultaneously... You know, girls in another part of the world would be frolicking around a field in saffron colored tunics, like both aiming to please this very complicated goddess. Um, And I just feel like this can also be seen throughout all of her famous stories, her just contrast between her love of life and her appreciation of death. Um, And of course, how that all ties into her extreme temper, because 
pride and anger are definitely her faults. <laughs> um, and I also, so I want to talk first about the contradiction of her being the goddess of virginity and childbirth. Cause obviously like one doesn't quite happen without the other, except if you're Mary. Um, but I think it's because Artemis supported women in all stages of their lives. I think she hated the idea of people, but specifically men telling women what to do with their bodies and their babies. For example, when the goddess Niobe mocked, Leto, Artemis's mother, for only having two children. Mm. She was like, you only have two? She goes, I have 14, seven daughters and seven sons, a perfect family. Well, what the hell are they the god of? The moon and the sun? Like, what? Like, <laughs> shut up. And Artemis was like, uh-uh, you don't be judgy, especially not on my mom. And she retaliated by killing her seven daughters. <laughs> and then Apollo was like, wow, I also want to defend my mom. And he killed uh, her seven sons, hmm. leaving this woman with no children and to mourn forever. <laughs> hey, you know what? That's the burden of immortality. Uh, but as usual with Artemis, her weakness sometimes gets in the way of her greater mission, um, especially when it came to the topic of virginity, because uh, she took it very seriously. And in order to be part of her inner circle, virginity was mandatory and non-negotiable, no matter the circumstance. And this brings us to maybe Artemis's worst moment, in my opinion, uh, the destruction of Callisto. Callisto was a young woman in her hunting party, some say she was like a princess from another town, whatever. Um, and she was like walking around the forest one day and is raped by Zeus. Some people say he was even disguised as Artemis when he did it. So could go either way. But either way, he assaults her. She becomes pregnant with his son. She names it him Arcus. And she tries to hide it from Artemis as long as she can. But when Artemis discovers that Callisto had broken her vow, even though it wasn't it's not her, her fault, fault yeah. uh, she banished her from the hunting party and turned her into a bear and then proceeded to hunt her. In some versions, she makes her own son hunt the bear because he was a baby when it happens. So he like grows up and hunts his own mother and doesn't even realize it. Mm. But the gods did not feel like this was a suitable punishment for being raped. Uh, they really, <laughs> I, I know <laughs> they're real wishy washy over there <laughs> up and up in mountain Olympus. Um, they couldn't turn her back into a human. So they did the next best thing. They sent her to the heavens, turning her into a constellation, which we now know as Ursa major. Mm. Or the Great Bear. <laughs> yeah, and that's where the Big Dipper is, yeah. right? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, I think a couple things about this story are really interesting. I think the idea, first, of her being the goddess of both childbirth and virginity leans very strongly into the idea of pro-choice, which is a very modern-day mm -hmm. idea of, like, we want women to be able to use their bodies in the way in which they choose. Yeah. But I think this other part of the story is a very ancient tale because we saw the same thing with Medusa, mm -hmm. where she was yep. in the temple of Athena and was raped, I believe, by Poseidon mm -hmm. and then had to be shunned away from the temple. Yeah. Both by women, by Athena and by Artemis. And I think it kind of shows how there's this male power figure. And when women are used abusively by men, powerful women also turn their backs on them. Yeah. And, like, say, like, you're not worthy. You're not as good as me. You're slutty. You know, you're slut-shaming right. the people Like, you must you. have let this happen in right. some way. Because I feel like Artemis is taking this, like, weird position, like you're saying, that, like, some women of power do, of, like, well, you just have to not let that happen. You just have right. to change your behavior to not let that happen. And it's like, Callista's like, Artemis, you're a goddess. You have magical powers. Yeah. You have a magic bow and arrow i don't have that yeah meanwhile like, artemis is like but what were you wearing <laughs> i feel like that's what she was saying she was yeah. like no, like i feel like artemis took the position of like 
I have the power to not make this make this not happen, so you mm-hmm. should too, even though she's literally magical. Right. And also, do we know who – was it a specific god that raped It was this Zeus. Woman? It was Zeus. So yeah, it's also, her dad. It's also her dad, and her mom was raped. So this gives this, like, other triangle of, like, people not wanting to turn in family members – who create, like, a, or who commit atrocious crimes. Oh, yeah, because it's kind of like, she's like, well, you know, like, Zeus is a good guy. I have all my hounds because of him. I'm, like, the, you know, leader of the forest because of him. And I feel like it's also that thing of, like, women in power making excuses for men in power because ultimately her power is tie- is linked with him. Right. And also then there she might be having this threat of, like, well, my dad was Zeus and my mom was raped and look how powerful I am. Who is this woman going to be right. that might be more powerful than me? Yeah. Because you're literally playing a card game as a woman all the time yeah. on how to stack yourself up next to men. And mm-hmm. it's very unfortunate that the story from thousands of years ago is exactly the same as it is right now. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Absolutely. The metaphors and, are well, unreal. And also like maybe Callisto said, no, he raped me. And, it's also likely that Artemis was like, I don't believe you. Right. I think that was um, a big point in that film, Promising Young Woman. Like, there's that great scene where, like, you know, Carrie Mulligan is, like, going to these women. And she's like, you told her she was lying. Like, you didn't believe her. Yeah. And, like, and then all this, these terrible things happened, you know? And it's, like, it's, a, it's these tales as old as time. Like, mm-hmm. this has been happening fucking forever. Right. Ugh. So... Uh, that's a famous story about her <laughs> wrath against women. Um, but in most stories, she is unleashing her wrath on men. Um, <laughs> she once, uh, <laughs> sent a wild boar to kill Adonis because he once boasted that he was a better hunter than her. <laughs> kill him. Uh, it may have, you know, been a little unnecessary. Um, but, <laughs> but if you're the goddess of the hunt and some bro is like, yeah. I'm a better hunter than it's you. Like, Shut it's the like, fuck up. No, you're not. Um, but usually it was because a man was behaving inappropriately. Uh, I guess her dad gets a green card, as we said <laughs> earlier. Uh, in one story, Hera, Zeus's wife, sent a giant named Titios to rape Artemis's mother, Leto. And as we all know, she's fairly protective of her mother. So she shot him with arrows, but it wasn't enough. So she also cursed him by keeping him barely alive and having vultures eat his liver for eternity yes (laughs) oh my god yes how hitchcock of her what (laughs) i love that i love that like did that inspire the birds because it's horrifying yo most directors and like authors are super well read so i guarantee i guarantee that inspired it um and of course we have her most famous story the punishment of action So Acteon was hunting in the forest one day when he came across Artemis and her female companions bathing. Oh, this is my favorite one. Artemis is furious because she took her virginity so seriously that other men weren't even allowed to see her naked. Mm. Now, in some versions, he runs away immediately. In most, he stares and gawks even after he's told to leave. And in another version, he attempts to rape her. Uh, whatever happens in the in-between, every story has the same ending. Artemis turns Acteon into a stag, but instead of hunting him herself, she allows Acteon to be hunted by his own dogs, the ones that he hunts with, and they chase him and devour him just like that guy from Game of Thrones. Oh, <laughs> I can't remember his name. Oh. Yeah, not Baratheon, right? No, 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 no. He's the one who has his own. He's married to Sansa. Yeah, he like cut off that guy's penis. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hate. Him. I can't remember his name, but he was the absolute worst, and it reminds me of that scene. He of, gives like, me so much anxiety. I can't even think about it I, sometimes. I have to block that I part of the show out. Hated him, and I wanted him to be eaten by dogs. But yeah. then also Jezebel was eaten by dogs in the Bible, so that's an interesting thing. And she was. Kind we of, have not covered her yet. No, and we should. We definitely should. But um, you know what? This scene always reminds me of. Mm -hmm. is that scene in i always picture the scene in fantasia with the centaurs Mm. and they're like kind of bathing in the water getting ready for the male centaurs and i know that's not the same but i always picture 
that type of lagoon is where like Artemis would be. Absolutely. Like brushing through the willow tree right. and like coming upon like all these women. I mean, like <laughs> flower bras and like, you know. I always loved that scene in Fantasia. Me it was too. like my favorite portion. And then I was so sad when I figured out they like cut out like this really racist scene in it. Yeah horrible it's, pre- it's pretty rough some of <sighs> it uh, but then you know it's like why do they have to do that well because they're racist but and anyways. it was also like the 1960s <sighs> not yeah. an excuse not an excuse just i'm um, glad they cut it glad they cut it learn your lessons um okay so anyways he's gone um but it's not always the same punishment for men that watch her bathe uh one man a guy named cypriotes uh watched her bathe and she just turned him into a woman Maybe she was feeling generous that day. I don't know. The peeping Tom uh, vibes are wild <laughs> for Artemis. She must have been, like, so fly. Mm-hmm. But it wasn't always about protecting her virginity. Remember, she is also the protector of the forest and animals. Uh, she definitely killed animals, but she did it as a sacred act. Because we do know that, like, there is a part of, like, hunting that is part of, like, conserving. Probably because, like, we fucked up in the first place and, like, <laughs> introduced, like... Yes. Not like, you know, like invasive species or whatever. But like, it's always been a part of like culture. Right. You know? There is like sustainable and survival yes. farming and and like agriculture. And yeah. we see that. And then there's factory farming and hunting right. and whatever. We see it <laughs> yeah. so like truly through a lot of like na- First Nation, Indigenous, mm-hmm. Native people. Yep. Absolutely. And I feel like that's how she saw it as right. like as if she was like a first person being mm-hmm. like, no, like that's not how you do it. Like, you're doing it to serve your pride or serve and something exploit. else You're and exploiting, exploiting the animal. The environment, yeah. And she didn't, she didn't like that. Um, so there was a guy named King Agamemnon who once killed a sacred deer in her forest. And he did this. He certainly knew it was her forest because he's also, again, boasting that he's a better hunter than her. Oh not okay. God. Everybody's with these, trying to kill these deer, <laughs> like on. crazy wild people. So to punish him, she was like, all right, well, you have to sacrifice your own daughter to me or you're going to die or something. I don't really know what the, if not was, but she said, you have to sacrifice your daughter to me. That's a big God move. Real big. Gods love that. And big God right- energy. <laughs> <laughs> BGE. <laughs> uh, <laughs> And right before he is about to kill his daughter, Artemis switched the daughter out for a deer, uh, one that she said okay, was okay to kill. And she did this to teach him that killing isn't just for fun or sport. She's like, would you enjoy killing your daughter? No, you wouldn't. Mm-hmm. So you should think of like a deer as something sacred and special. So this is the Abraham and Isaac story. Yes, it is. A hundred percent. Okay. And she was like, it's just, she was like, I want you to think about what you're doing when Mm. you're doing it um but she's still kind of pissed at him so instead of killing his daughter she took her away and made her a priestess of one of her temples Perfect. (laughs) she's like your daughter's mine now virgin goodbye well i mean what a blessed task (laughs) yeah (laughs) like like a a hunter's daughter great (sighs) so we are getting a good bit of male hate here um but of course she didn't hate all men In fact, there was not all men, not all men, but there was one that she loved deeply, maybe as a lover, which of course uh, she could not indulge in. But I like to believe that she loved him as a friend, a hunting companion, a brother, just like her favorite person. And this is Orion. Now, there are, as usual, a few different ways that this kind of played out. One version is that he tried to rape her while they're hunting in the woods and she murdered him in self-defense. Another version, one that's more commonly told, is that she and Orion got engaged or maybe they were getting too close. I don't know. But her brother Apollo couldn't stand to see his sister break her vow. So one day he and Artemis are standing by the ocean and he bets her that she can't hit the thing out in the ocean. The thing that's floating way far out. Oh, with her bow and arrow. Mm-hmm. And of course, Artemis was like, <laughs> watch and learn, little brother. She fires her arrow, hits the object on her first try. But when the object floats to the shore and she looks down, she sees that it's Orion. Apollo had tricked her into shooting the love of her life. 
She is devastated. She asks Zeus to spare his life. And he did the same way he did with Callisto by making him into a constellation. And I would say he is one of the most famous constellations. It's about to pop up. Yeah. If you're in the northeast Mm -hmm. of the United States, we're going to see it soon on the horizon. (sighs) So another alternative ending is that Apollo does the dirty work himself, sending a scorpion to kill Orion and his dog. And then there's one more where Gaia or Mother Earth births the scorpion to kill Orion and his dog. Either way, we get two constellations out of this story, Orion and Scorpio, because it's about to be Scorpio say, season. It is Scorpio close to Orion? Mm-hmm. Okay. So I then think. I think. It would make sense because it's, because it's o- about to be in season. Yeah, October. Yeah, right, right, right. So, I mean, all I know is the first time that I see orion's belt on the horizon because that's one that the we can see with the light pollution in baltimore oh i know (laughs) we can absolutely still see horizon i always forget that other people can see more stars than us (laughs) (laughs) so like when that one pops up over the horizon i'm like my birthday's coming Mm -hmm. (laughs) i get really excited Mm -hmm. i know it's fall and i'm assuming scorpio is very close which is where the story comes from yes that's why they're linked right and of course they're also linked to one super bright star, which of course is his dog, Sirius. Yeah. The Sirius star. That's Sirius. Orion's dog. I love that. Uh, I love it. Like Sirius Black? Mm-hmm. Or mm-hmm. his brother Regulus, the star that's really close to it. <laughs> <laughs> now, a lot of people like to paint Artemis as a lesbian because she centered her surrendered herself with women and kind of like shirked off men. But I feel like this story with Artemis makes me believe that she was asexual, but not aromantic. I think that she had a lot of love feelings towards Orion. I think she thought of him as her greatest companion, but ultimately had no sexual desire for him, Mm -hmm. you know? And I almost wonder too, if like, that's why she asks Zeus for eternal virginity. She's like, I'm just not interested. I don't want any part of it. Like, I think that that's a pretty legitimate read of, like, it's not that she was doing it for any other reason, but, like, it was just a choice. She was like, I don't want to do this, so I won't. Mm. And uh, I don't know. I mean, what do you think about reading her as asexual? I think it's a great reading. And I also, I try to, anytime I'm thinking about a god or goddess that was written at a specific time, I try to think about the people who were writing it. And the, Mm -hmm. the... Women at that time didn't have the power, but the men were writing the stories. So to them, it's like, this girl's a hard ass and just doesn't want to have sex with me. Mm -hmm. But really, there are so many choices that women can make about their sexuality that they weren't allowed to make. Yeah. So they were writing in the sense that there's this woman making a different choice. Perhaps it's chastity. Perhaps, you know, it's working within a specific church or religion. Mm -hmm. And I think reading those women as asexual or as performing against the standard yeah. of what was expected in ancient Greece is a great read. Yeah, I think so. Because again, I feel like that's the beauty of Artemis is that she's showing the broad spectrum of female choices, mm-hmm. you know? And I just think that she gives women a lot more, like as we like to say, nuance than maybe they had at the time. Yeah, and also we often think about in a lot of like um, Western religions that there's like this male figure God Mm -hmm. and any priest or nun are following that God. Mm -hmm. But here what we have is a whole bunch of women following a female goddess. Yeah, and like a very flawed goddess because I also feel like virginity is often connected to purity Purity. or perfection. And she is just not that and I feel like every story about her is like I have a temper I'm not a perfect person like I lash out and like but I am also strong and I make my own decisions and I want other people to do the same Mm. like I don't know I just I I think she's so interesting and even though she is like greatly feared for the things that she does she's still beloved and worshipped um I love this prepubescent and adolescent 
Athenian girls were sent to the sanctuary of Artemis at uh, Brauron to serve her for a year. This was like a coming of age ritual. And during this time, the girls were called Arctoi. I like to think of it as like a Girl Scouts kind of thing. Oh, yeah. They're like selling cookies. Yeah. And Arctoi is little she bears. That's what that means. <laughs> I love that. Isn't this that is so cute? Merida as well, like turning somebody's mom into a bear. And a bow and hunt. Stop Bo it. Bow and arrow. Yeah, bar, bow, a huntress. A, hun- a, hunter- <laughs> a bear. A, hun- a hunter- oh my gosh. I have to assume that this story had a lot to do with Merida. It had to be. We have bears, bows and arrows. Her mom's getting turned into it. She Little bears. Back. Little baby boy bears. <laughs> getting turned into bears. Yeah. For sure. That, I mean, and that's All great, of it. It's perfect. Uh, also. For, first Disney princess with an accent, by the way. An appropriate accent an to appropriate her culture. appropriate accent. And culture. also, she's making, Merida's making strong de- decisions about her own love life. To not get married. Yeah. Yeah. <gasps> okay. Very, Ar- Merida's an Artemis. She totally is. So women would also pray to her during childbirth, birth, um, but then they would also kind of blame her if their child died. Um, Artemis was more of a minor deity for Greek citizens, but she was a prominent like main deity in what is now modern day Turkey. Mm. She was the fertility goddess. Istanbul, so, Constantinople. Mm-hmm, all of it. <laughs> so they actually... It's really interesting. That culture kind of ignored her hunting skills and they really focused on her kind of fertility, virginity, birthing, like all of that aspect of it. Okay. So this is why statues that they have found of her in Turkey, she is pictured as a woman with multiple breasts or like strings of eggs around her neck. Like she's pictured very differently because huh. they weren't emphasizing the fact that she was a strong huntress. Oh, she's they were like a fertile fertility yeah. god. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So very it's very cool. interesting how the same person can be perceived in two to- different cultures totally differently. Mm. And also that she was much more important you know, over in Turkey than she was in Greece. Like really like people liked her, but like she wasn't like a main god for them. Um but Artemis has remained an influential goddess far beyond her time. In fact, she had a really strong impact on a French woman named Diane de Poitiers. Uh, So Diane was a mistress of King Henry II, and it was during their time where an ancient artifact started to make their way around Europe. And one of the first statues that made it to France where they were living was of Artemis. And Diane fell in love with her. Diane had always felt independent. She was like, I like being a mistress. I don't want to be a queen. Like, I just want to live my fucking life. And then she's like, then there's this woman who just embodies like everything I'm feeling, except for the virginity, of course. So Diane was like, you know what? I'm going to start using some more of my power. And she... T- so she tells Henry the second straight up. She goes, look, let's just be clear. I know I'm your mistress, but I want to be more than that. I want to be your moon mistress. Oh, <laughs> what a fun term. Whatever that means. I don't like know what it means, but I like it. But I love it. <laughs> and then she was like, I have all this money. I'm going to commission statues of Artemis all over the Chateau d'Arnais when she was renovating it. Wow. She takes this gorgeous French mansion. She puts a fountain out front with Diana. She then puts a nymph posed with a stag and the hounds above the front door. And then on the top of the building, there is a giant stag with dogs like all over it. Then inside, she had custom tapestries made throughout the house that told the story of Artemis. And it is also believed that because Diane really loved her connection with the moon, she had the sculptor add crescent moon symbols to Artemis's image, which obviously stuck around because she was almost always with a crescent moon symbol now. Yeah, I have a moon cycle above my bed because of her. Yeah, it's like, incredible. <sighs> straight up, the 28-day moon cycle. <sighs> And in turn, Diane would often add moon symbols to her own portraits to show her dedication to Artemis. 
which is ultimately fitting because in Roman mythology, Artemis's name is Diana, which of course inspired the name of Wonder Woman. Diana and Huntress. I just feel like all of these women are badasses. And since then, she has inspired even more characters, I believe, such as Merida and, of course, Katniss Everdeen from The Hunger Games. And I am confident that she will continue to inspire women and cause men to cower in fear for generations to come. Mm, I love that. I, I also love how feminine archery is yes. in, in like throughout mythology and like storied history. Archery seems to be something that's very continually feminine, and mm -hmm. I love it. Absolutely. Although after the Hunger Games, there was like a big upt uptick. In, oh yeah, yeah. You, oh, we talk you about it in the episode. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have like hard numbers as to like how many young girls got into archery because of that those movies and right. those books. It's like similar it's to like Lisa Simpson and the saxophone. Yes, it's like, it is. I can get here. Okay, Ugh. that was so incredible. <laughs> I love her. We have now rounded out the the like big greek women the big greek women yeah we definitely have a lot more to do there are so a lot many. more like minor deities and but stuff there's like also that. so many deities in so many cultures that it's hard to just like yeah greek is just the most famous greek slash roman is mm -hmm. like the most famous so we're working our way around yes <laughs> and if you have any more fun artemis stories to share let me know there was just like it's overwhelming. It, and, and it's also like a lot of times it's just like in a bulleted list. And I'm like, I want to tear the, tell this in more of like a narrative way, but how do I do that? Yeah. <laughs> and I, I think it's hard too because it's um, quote unquote a dead religion where it's like people treat it as stories now. Yeah. Whereas it's like if you were to do something that's like in a religion that is still striving, there isn't any like off tick of the truth. It's yeah. like this is what happened and yeah. that's what the – Bible says or the Vedas or mm -hmm. you know the Quran like yeah. that's what it says you're done and exactly you're like, okay <laughs> are you ready for more drinks I'm ready okay we'll be right back we're jumping into the future <laughs> It's the coldest of cold cases. Five women murdered and mutilated in Victorian London. But trust me, everything you think you know about Jack the Ripper and his victims is wrong. I'm historian Hallie Rubenhold, and when I went back into the records, it became clear that the real story of those murdered women is richer and far more disturbing than we'd ever been told. Listen to Bad Women, The Ripper Retold, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We're back. We're with back. Another feisty lady. I'm very excited. I don't know anything about her, so I'm like really excited to learn. Okay, cool. Do you want to know your drink first? I do. So this is in super poor taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the drink that inspired me is the Iraqi car bomb. <laughs> but anytime a drink is called a car bomb it just means you're dropping a shot into a right. beer or uh -huh. a red bull or whatever so the technical iraqi car bomb is an amber beer with a shot of cinnamon snops dropped in uh-huh um so this is an entire glass of not your father's root beer <laughs> which is like spiked root beer yeah with uh two shots of cinnamon snops Ooh. schnapps yeah did I say it wrong? You're saying snops. Schnops. Schnops. Gonna go a little sh in there. <laughs> snops. Um, and I'm calling it flight forward. Okay. I love it. So at home, I hope you drop a shot in. Ah. We're gonna be do it. Do All right. It. I'm gonna pour it in. I'm gonna pour <laughs> a little bit in mine. Bit. You're gonna pour a yeah, little yeah, bit yeah, into yeah. yours. Yeah, there's already some in there. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Cheers. Cheers. Ooh. Mm. Ooh, i love it it's like cinnamon <laughs> alcoholic root beer well, it was funny because i was smelling it and i was like this smells like root beer mm. but like i i didn't i thought you poured like a sam adams into the glass mm. but it yeah i love it <laughs> i love not your father's root beer a lot of people like i love a soda i don't drink a lot of soda but mm. when i'm like down for one i'm like this <sighs> is it yeah so not your father's root beer is like a soda that gets you drunk, which I mean, perfect. Come also, on. you can make a root beer float with it. Yeah. And I'm 
I mean, that's one of my favorite desserts of all time is a root beer float. How could it not be? Oh, they're so good. Okay. What do you know about <sighs> Senator Lieutenant Colonel okay. Danny Duckworth? So I know that she's a senator. I know that she's in the Army. And now I know that she does not have portions of her legs, which I'm yeah. guessing happened in the war. I don't know. Yeah, that's why the drink's in poor taste. <laughs> okay. So I'm really curious. Yeah, that's all I know is that, like, she's a senator. But I've oh, I've heard the name Tammy Duckworth, and I never knew that she – was in the military or had this happened to her. Yeah. Whatever happens. Um, so She's I'm a, really interested. Like, it's like, normally it's like, I feel like people lead with something like that. Mm -hmm. And I feel like with Timmy Duckworth, it's like, they haven't really yeah. like, I don't know. It's, I'm really interested. <laughs> She's a super cool person. I had fun researching. It's one of those things where, like, when we're doing a season of bangers and you see Senator, you're like, oh, that might be boring. Yeah. It's not. Great. It's very um, modern, though, so we're going to have to talk about, like, she's currently in the Senate, like, yeah. as we speak. So we're going to have to talk about some things that have happened recently, okay. but also just, like, in the past. So. Perfect. Uh, Lada Tammy Duckworth was born in Bangkok, Thailand in Frank to Franklin Duckworth and Lamai. And I'm really struggling with her last name. It's a Thai Chinese last name. I think it's Samporparian. And she's considered Tammy is considered a natural born U.S. citizen because the longstanding regulation that if one of your parents is a U.S. citizen, then you in, in turn. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. So okay. like, even if you're born in another country, if your mom or dad is a U.S. citizen, you are a U.S. citizen. Okay. But she can't be president because no, she's a U.S. citizen. Oh, I thought like even if you were a U U.S. citizen, but you were born outside of the United States. Uh, I thought no. you had to be like born on U.S. soil. No, you can as long as you are born a U.S. citizen, because oh. that would exclude people who are born in like military bases and oh, stuff. Oh, interesting. So okay. as long as you're born an official U.S. citizen, which her dad is a U.S. citizen, at least that's what I understand. Okay. She could be president. Um, he was a veteran to the U.S. Army and the U.S. Marine Corps, and he fought in the Vietnam War, and her family. The Duckworth family has had people in every U.S. <gasps> war since the revolution. <gasps> no. Every war, which guess what That's that makes her so as an Asian a woman. A legacy child? Even better. Emily Ooh, Gilmore's a daughter of the American <laughs> Revolution. <gasps> she is a daughter of the American Revolution. And she's Asian. Oh, my God. Emily would roll over in her grave they all are <laughs> they hate it oh my gosh that's so fascinating it is every war oh my gosh every single war that's okay insane so one really important thing so again her mom is thai chinese a lot of people got pregnant during the Korean and Vietnamese war. Mm -hmm. I want to exclude at this point, the rape situations, which yeah. did happen. Mm -hmm. There were love stories yeah. that occurred as well. People met people and fell in love. Now, a lot of times those dads left mm -hmm. in Tammy's situation. Her dad didn't leave. Mm -hmm. So she grew up with the faith and hope that I am a U.S. citizen and I have only good things in the stars for me. Okay. So we also have a cousin who is a child of a loving war relationship. Oh, yeah. Or a military relationship. So it is such a beautiful thing when it happens and it works out. I just didn't want to, like, over-acknowledge the fact that it did work out really poorly for a lot of women. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Who, even though their babies could have technically been U.S. citizens, the guy just left and you have no proof. Yeah. So that's terrible. Anyway. Due to her early life living in Thailand, um, Tammy is fluent in Thai and Indonesian in addition to English. She attended multiple schools in that area, but it was really hard for her dad to find work in Southeastern Asia, so they had to get back to U.S. soil. Mm. But the family was really, really poor. They're not a well-off family, so they scraped up all of the money they had, and they flew as far far as they could to get onto U.S. soil, and that means Hawaii. So you have Tammy and her family living in Hawaii. They were really, really poor. They had no money. 
at some points in some interviews, the word starving was thrown around. Oh my gosh. They were working, as we talked about with um, Patsy Mint, Mink, they're yeah. working in sugar fields. They're yeah. getting money any way that they can. Which is interesting, too, because it's not, it's also a different turn from the traditional, like, man goes to war and, like, you know, falls in love sometimes or like whatever happens with a woman Prince from the Charming. Department. Yeah. And then like takes her back to America and like, you know, it's, you would like, I feel like the traditional like stereotypical story is that like, Oh, it's like for a better life or whatever. And it doesn't sound like that quite happened for them. And I think maybe it's because like he did try and like stay like, yeah. and not just rip her away from her family her and her family, culture, her culture, her yeah. life. He's like, I'm going to stay here. I'm going to raise my children here i'm yeah. gonna like be part of it but it was just really hard for him to find a job there yeah so they get to hawaii the whole family is working they're all trying to make money the kids are going to school her and her brother um but they just struggled they're surviving on the cheap ass school lunches which mm -hmm. today is called free and reduced lunch which means depending on how much your family makes in america you get either a free lunch or a reduced lunch However, the last 18 months, every kid in the United States has gotten a free lunch every day during the school year and during the summer. Wow. Did you know that? No. You could yourself show up at a public school over the summer and they would hand you a free lunch. What? For the, all of COVID because a lot of kids, their parents weren't considered essential. So they made sure to feed the kids all summer long. They oh got one God. meal a day. Yeah. So if you walked up, you got it. I was setting up my classroom one day with Caroline and Eliza and they came into my classroom and were like, you guys want lunch? And we were like, sure. They just gave us bagged lunches. Oh my gosh. Yeah. I didn't know that was a thing. It's been pretty incredible. So there has been no money exchanged for the last 18 months in public schools. Every kid gets free lunch every day, no matter what. That's great. It is great. So thanks, Michelle Obama. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Love you, girl. <laughs> so anyway, they're really struggling. I mean, she's in things like the Girl Scouts. She's trying to be influential. And even some of her schooling in uh, Southeastern Asia made her a little bit more advanced than the other students. So she mm. skipped a couple American grades because she was okay. just like on a different level. Mm -hmm. um, but... She also, oh, she was track and field too, which love you, girl. Um, <laughs> but there's stuff going on where like her teachers notice that they're like poor, poor, poor. So she had this one teacher who would at the end of every school day be like, oh gosh, I messed this up again. Can you guys stay and help me? And her and her brother would stay and help. And then he would pay them like $10 and be oh. like, go over to Taco Bell, <laughs> get some food. Cause he knew like if it's a Friday afternoon, you might not eat all weekend. Yeah. That's the thing that's scary about snowstorms. Like if you leave during a snowstorm, you give every kid a bag lunch before they leave because they, some kids are going home to empty cupboards and they might be stuck there for a week. Oh my God. So any day that a kid comes to school, no matter what they get food before they leave. And that's just the deal. That's great. I like, there's just like a lot of things like that, that I didn't know were worked into the system, yeah. but I know are necessary. Cause like, Obviously, there's also a lot of kids that live in food deserts, you yeah. know, which like I didn't know that was a thing until like, a couple of years ago and someone was telling me about it. And it's like, yeah, these areas of like Baltimore City, which you think like, no, there's not a lack of food. Like, what are you talking about? There's food everywhere in Baltimore City. And it's like, no, in some areas, there's literally not like, yeah. You don't have any grocery stores. It's like you Lexington have maybe Market like, and that's it. <laughs> or like you have like maybe like a CVS around the corner. Right. And like, that's where you get like groceries. And that's why they have that frozen cabinet in the corner. Yeah. Where you're and buying it's like, like egg waffles. There's just a lot of stuff that I didn't, I didn't really have to think about, you know? Yeah. We were very fortunate growing up. Yeah. But like, we don't have to think about the fact that if I go home, I might not have a fruit roll up sitting there. Right. Yeah. You know, <laughs> like that's like the type of privilege we had. So... She always felt a little embarrassed about telling her poorness story originally. Yeah. She did put out a memoir recently where she does elaborate more because she was the military story. She oh. was the Vietnam story. She's the female senator story. She's the Asian woman story. She's like, do I have to add poor as a layer? <sighs> so she does say, though, she will fight you to pick up a penny on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I am not joking. When I see money on the ground, I will take it. So, well, and it's just like, we were talking about identity earlier, just like you and I privately about how like 
identity is a weird thing and like it's also complicated and like you are more things at once yeah. like you're multiple you're multiple players on the chess board yeah and you're trying to play all of them oh gosh so she does end up uh and this is kind of bumping ahead she does end up graduating from the university of hawaii with a bachelor's in arts in political science and then goes on to get her master's of arts in international affairs and then begins her PhD program at the Northern Illinois University. So she's bumping over to Illinois. Okay. She's getting into the coattails of Barack Obama. <laughs> uh, so she's over in Illinois in the PhD program. Um, she's in this early university setting, and she's like, you know what? Everybody in my family since the American Revolution – with the last name Duckworth, has been in the military. So, like, obviously I should do that. So to follow in her dad's footsteps, she joins the ROTC. Um, and she is like, this is going to be great. I'm going to learn the military thing. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be in the Army Reserves where mm -hmm. you serve one weekend a month, mm. and then you get called away every now and again. So she is in the Army Reserve Officer Training Corps in 1990. As she's graduating from George Washington University, she becomes a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army Reserve in 1992 and decided, I want to fly helicopters. <gasps> and she says, the bigger, the uglier, the <laughs> dangerouser it looks, the I want to fly propellers. It. I, I love there. it. <laughs> she's like, if it's gross and weird and looks like it can't get off the ground, I want to fly it. <laughs> so that is like her thing. And she says that she is honored, and she, her words, that this little Asian woman would be given the right to this huge helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and she decides that she's going to do that because women could not go into combat on the ground yet. <gasps> yet? What the fuck year is this? Katie, this is the 1990s. This what? was still true. So I know there are women serving in World War II and Korea and Vietnam, but women were not allowed in combat. <gasps> they could be in the quote unquote army. In the army. But not in combat. So she is one of the first <gasps> female combat pilots. Oh my God. Ever. I didn't know that, that they ever. <sighs> they could like fly Learning messages. so much today. <sighs> they could fly messages. It's like. But she, you couldn't be in combat. So she's one of the first ever female combat That's pilots. That's very cool. It is cool. So while she's training, she meets a guy named Brian Bowlesbury. <laughs> and they get married. She keeps her last name, Duckworth, obviously, because, like, you know, America. Mm -hmm. And they get, they're married in 1993. She goes to flight school as a member of the Army Reserve. Later, she transforms to the Illinois Army National Guard. So now she's in the National Guard. She's not just in the reserves. And she works as a staff supervisor at the, like, international headquarters for Army Reserves and, you know, National Guard in Illinois. But in 2004, she's like, there's this big war going on right now, obviously post 9-11, and she doesn't necessarily agree with why they're fighting, but she's like, I'm a patriot. I'm in the Army Reserves. My family's fought in every single war. So she volunteers to go to <sighs> Iraq. Her husband is oh also going God. to Iraq. They're both veterans of the Iraq War. While in Iraq, she's doing her job. She's flying Black Hawk helicopters. Oh, so cool. I mean. Just the sound of it. It's so fucking cool. It is so fucking cool. But there's one day she's flying and there's a lucky hit. From an RPG, which is a rocket propelled grenade that hit her Black Hawk <gasps> and it went down. No. Her, her helicopter? Her helicopter <gasps> goes down. How do you survive that? Well, she was saved by some of her courageous soldiers pulling her out <gasps> of this helicopter. As we know, she lost her right leg at the hip, her left leg at the knee. Half of the blood in her body <gasps> broke her right arm and tore all of the tissue from it. She required major surgery to repair it and almost lost function in that <sighs> arm entirely. She was the first American female double amputee of the Iraq War. 
And due to this, obviously, she got a Purple Heart and an Air Medal and so many other awards. But she's hospitalized for 13 months. And um, she was transferred to the hospital completely unconscious. So they do all these surgeries. They're fixing <gasps> her arm. They're taking her legs. They're doing oh all these my things. God, and she doesn't even know. Doesn't know. <gasps> she wakes up. And her husband's in the room, of course. He's a veteran as well, holding her hand. And she's just, my feet hurt so bad. Oh my, my legs feel like they're on fire. They're on fire. I need Tylenol. I need pain medication. And her husband, just shock on his face, walks out to get the doctors. And they come back in and tell her that she has lost both of her legs. And then she lives in the hospital for the next year. That is so upsetting. It's traumatizing. I, <sighs> such an active, like involved person. And then you just, when also like waking up and like just assuming that they're still there. Like I think they call it like what phantom limb syndrome where yeah. like, you're like, no, I'm feeling something there. They can't not be there. Right. Cause like, when the, when the accident when not the accident, when the attack happened, yeah. her legs were on fire. She did get hit. So that's what she's remembering feeling. Oh, my God. And now they're gone. (gasps) Oh, my God. She does say, if you could tell me right now, you snap your fingers and you go back to the first day of Army training, except you're still going to lose your legs, I'd do it all again (gasps) in a second. So. Wow. She's bold as fuck. Okay. Okay. (laughs) So (laughs) as I said, the couple had been living and working in Illinois as the National Guard for a long time. And she had her degrees, multiple degrees at this point, just a bachelor's and master's in poli sci. So in 2006, Tammy decided she was going to put what she learned in college into actual effect. And she ran for political office. She had been encouraged by a couple democratic house members like you're cool do it after longtime incumbent henry hyde announced his retirement from congress several candidates began campaigning for that open seat tammy did win the primary for the democratic party but she only received 49 percent of the votes for the seat she lost by under five thousand votes wow so there's the congress seat and she loses it but Then the party does, the Democratic Party does appoint her to be the director of veteran affairs. So she served in that position until 2009. And during her time, she starts a program for veterans with PTSD and veterans with brain injuries. Mm. So she's really working for people like her Mm -hmm. who are living with a disability. Yeah. Just to get it out of the way in terms of politics, um, She is probably about as bipartisan as it comes in the Congress and the Senate because like Democratic versus Republican speaking, you have very different ideas on the military. You have very different ideas on gun control. And because she was in the military and because she owns guns, she has this very different idea of how things should work. Now, obviously she votes for stronger gun control being a Democrat, but she has this great amount of respect for how guns should be used, which right. is exactly what we need Yeah, in talking about gun control. We just don't need people who are shooting their mouths off. We need people who <laughs> have actively been trained in and use guns on a regular basis to tell us what should be done. Right. No, absolutely. Because like I can talk, I can say like, I hate guns all I want, but also like, I don't know anything about them. Like I'm not involved in that at all. And I'm also not like trained on a regular basis. No, I also don't know anything about the laws or anything like I like, or the background checks or the, this or the, that. I feel like there should be more, but like, (laughs) yeah. And she does like, she does do things like one time they were doing a forum on the Congress floor about gun control And you're not allowed to have your cell phone in there as a congressperson. But just to prove the point, she hid her cell phone in her prosthetic leg and brought it in and was like, look what I could hide and get in here. Like, we need stricter laws about guns. Like, yeah, just so you know. Yeah. Um, But also just in general, she supports abortion rights. She supports the Affordable Care Act. And she is big on a total comprehensive immigration reform where there's a pathway to citizenship. She's like, we need to get a hundred thousand, um, Syrian refugees over here stat. We need to get these, um, 
South American kids and Central American kids reunited with their families. Mm-hmm. Like, this is not okay. So that's just, like, her basic politics. So in 2009, President Barack Obama nominates Tammy to be the Assistant Secretary of Public Intergovernmental Affairs and for the U.S. Department of Veteran Affairs. And the U.S. Senate confirmed her position on April 22nd. She coordinated a joint, like, interactive hearing so that the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development would help with veteran homelessness. She worked to help address unique challenges faced by female as well as Native American veterans. And then she also created an online communication facility to improve VA accessibility. So her entire time in, like, the House has been, like, really yeah. working to help veterans. So I hate, hate when people like our former president are like, we care more about immigrants than we do about our own veterans. It's like, no, there are people working on that. Yeah. Like there are people working on that every day. That's their entire, this is her entire job. Yeah. Is to work on veteran affairs. Yeah. And it feels like not a lot of people are listening to her. Yeah. Like (laughs) she's like trying really hard. Yeah, exactly. It's like totally erasing her job and what she's done. Yeah. And making a shit ton of change too. Like she's actually doing things and people aren't listening. And, and a lot of the veteran organizations are like, let's give this girl a medal. Yeah. She's great. Yeah. And I feel like it's also really easy to be like, we should care more about our veterans and then do nothing. Because like, like, All of the Trumpians. Yeah. And it's like, you're actively disregarding this person who actually cares so much about the veterans. And has experience in it. And isn't a draft dodger. Because she's a Democrat. You asshole. Because she's a Democrat. And it's like, you're not paying any attention to her because she's on the other side of the political aisle. When it's like, okay, if you really care about the vets, why don't you invest in what she's fucking saying? Because she knows what she's talking about. Yeah. And especially because a lot of the veteran or like veteran organizations believe in her. And like, I'm not saying every single one, but it's really disheartening because I know one thing I kept thinking about when I was doing this story is it's so uncommon to see Democrats so pro-military. Yeah, it is. And it's really nice to see that it is a very valid concern we have so many listeners that have spouses and children and you know family members who work for the military and in the military and it's so important it's not like a god bless america issue you know Mm -hmm. there's so much involved yeah so it's a weird little thing going there so then she's doing all this just kind of working as an appoint an appointment you know what i mean Mm -hmm. she's not technically in office yet In 2011, she does launch a campaign again for the House of Reps, and the Daughters of the American Revolution pick her up. Mm. And they're like, you know what? Your family's been in every fucking war. Like, get on our side. And they also erect a statue to her. I'm sorry. Katie, a statue. What? (laughs) The Daughters of the American Revolution erect a statue to her that is dedicated to female veterans. It's so funny. (laughs) It's one of those things where, like, the Daughters of the American Revolution are, like, so fucked up in some ways. And I feel like when they're trying to be good. It's laughable. (laughs) I love it. I it's love like, it. You know what? Because I do firmly believe that we do need more diverse statues. <laughs> but also it's like, how much should that statue cost? And could the money have been used in better ways? But also the social impact of a statue is important. So I don't know. <laughs> it's like a social impact of a statue from the Daughters of American <laughs> Revolution to an Asian <laughs> woman. It's like, this is great. It's such a fun I story. like my brain's exploding. It's, it's really like, hard. <laughs> It's also, like, I feel like it's like, they're like, no, this is just what we do. We're diverse now. Yeah, we're diverse now. <laughs> look, look at our statue. Look at our statue. <laughs> to Tammy Duckworth. And also, if you're alive and somebody erects a statue of you, do you not feel like Saddam Hussein? Oh my gosh. I don't even know. What happens if somebody know. puts up a statue of you when you're living? Is that weird? It'll never happen to me, so I can't even relate. <laughs> oh, me neither. Who can relate? <laughs> so, she then decides she's going to launch. After the statue goes up, she's like, I'm going to launch a campaign and I'm going to run for Congress again for the seat in Illinois. She defeats, you know, the primary Democratic people. She goes into the general election with some controversy because 
she doesn't have legs and she's like in a wheelchair and like is talking about like I'm a veteran and this is what I want to do and somebody says in a debate or on air my god that's all she ever talks about <gasps> our true heroes the men and women who serve us it's the last thing in the world they want to talk about <laughs> wow like wow right what that's her whole identity fuck you fuck you i <laughs> I'm uncomfortable with that. I'm uncomfortable with that situation. <laughs> I hate it. I just, <laughs> what? So you're, she's one of the few people who actually has like this experience and you're like, wow, will she talk about anything else? <laughs> like, and it's like, no, because if she did talk about other things like growing up poor in Hawaii, like you would be like, Oh my gosh, crime here. Like, you know, there's, or being an Asian woman. <laughs> right. It's like, you made her strategically pick this part of her identity and you're mad at her about it. Like, because what? It, it makes you uncomfortable because you actually like that she's a veteran. Oh my God. <laughs> so in 2012, Duckworth became the first Asian American woman from Illinois in Congress and the first woman living with a disability in Congress and the first member of Congress that was born in Thailand. Mm. So that's a lot of shit all at Again, once. Again, <laughs> she's more than one thing. <laughs> exactly. Like, <laughs> so while working in 2013, there's this government shutdown, and she publicly re returned 8.2% of her congressional salary in solidarity with those who are furloughed from <gasps> government workers. In 2014, she did retire as lieutenant colonel. You know, over, you know, she had been... Uh, the attack occurred in 2004. She doesn't retire as Lieutenant Colonel until 2014. She does get uh, reelected. She faced another military colonel against her. He was a Marine and a Republican. She repeated, she defeated him with 56% of the vote. Mm. I also want to point out that right now she finally finishes her PhD. Oh, so cool. that PhD she started way yeah. before she went to Operation Iraqi Freedom. She is now finishing over okay. 10 years later. In 2016, Tammy decided that she was going to up her game. She's like, I need to challenge the incumbent Republican Senator Mark Kirk for his seat in the Illinois Senate. She defeated two Democratic people in the primary election. But during a televised debate, first Mark Kirk, she brought up her ancestors past and military service in the United States. And Kirk responded, oh, I'd forgotten that your parents came all the way from Thailand to serve George Washington on camera. So it, he's calling her a liar. He's calling her a liar and not acknowledging that her dad was a white man. It's just like, you're an Asian woman and that's all you and that's are. That's all you are. It's like, no, fuck you, man. Like I look like an Asian woman, but I have a white father. Right. There's like a whole, there's 50% of me that you're completely disregarding because I, I look physically Asian. Yeah. Which I feel like ha like happens to a lot of biracial people. It's like, yeah. I feel like half of them gets totally ignored and it's like to have it happen so publicly and also to just, there's an actual statue of the daughters of the American revolution that they put up and you're calling her like as if they don't do their fucking fact checking <laughs> that's and all they do they don't have jobs to call her a liar on national television what an idiot okay dummy dummy um so obviously the comment launched a human rights campaign against mark kirk because this is deeply offensive and racist and just totally judgmental of biracial people as Absolutely. you just said so one thing that's important is that she does fight for the rights of Asian Americans and Asian people living in America all the time and fights that they should be more represented in government. She says that the idea that we're the model major majority that doesn't need help from you is incorrect. People don't acknowledge that racism occurs against Asian people. Yeah. Obviously in this last year with COVID, we've seen it much more prevalently. Yeah. Um, 
And Asian hate has just been on the rise, or maybe not on the rise, but more publicized. Well, yeah. I mean, there's that guy who went on that fucking rampage, like, against Asian women. Like, it's horrible. And it is a racism that is more um, silenced and, like, not as acknowledged, you know? And, like, but it is still there. Like, it's why there, I'm... It's why there's that whole campaign of, like, stop Asian hate. Like, it exists. Like, acknowledge that it exists. And it's a fucking problem. Right. Like, the first the first <laughs> way in getting rid of your addiction is acknowledge you have an addiction. Yeah. So, like, stop hating Asian people, maybe. But she does say that, like, one of the hardest things about being in politics as an Asian woman is people already assume that women are supposed to be submissive. Asian women yeah. are really supposed to be submissive. Mm-hmm. And when you speak what you're thinking, people are overly shocked at you. Yeah. Like double shocked, like woman shocked and Asian shocked. Yeah. (laughs) And also living with a disability shocked. Yeah. So it's like, how do we perceive this woman who's saying all these things? But this debate's going on. She ends up getting endorsed by president Barack Obama during, and he was from Illinois and she's running for one of his Senate seats. Like he left that Senate seat and went to be president and then other people filled it. And now he's like, no, totally support her. She did win a Senate seat with 54% of the votes, making her um, in the class of the second and third Asian American senators. So there was one Asian American female Senator And then she and another Asian American woman were elected that same year. Mm. So they're the second and third total. Among Senate freshmen that year, she ranked super highly because she's so bipartisan, because she can work in so many Mm -hmm. areas. She's credited with saving the Americans with Disability Act because she like led a public opposition Mm -hmm. to this controversial bill. Both the Veterans Service Organization and the Paralyzed Veterans of America recognize her leadership in defending Americans with disabilities as a bill. In 2018, the government shuts down because everybody can't agree on a fucking budget or whatever. Uh, And Trump made some comments about the Senate putting immigrants in front of veterans, like we said earlier. She gets on air and she says, I spent my entire adult life looking out for the well-being, the training, the equipping of troops for whom I was responsible. Sadly, this is something that the current occupant of the Oval Office does not seem to care to do. And I will not be lectured about what our military needs by a five deferrent draft dodger. (laughs) I have a message for cadet bone spurs. If you cared about our military, you'd stop baiting Kim Jong-un into a war that could put 85 5,000 American <sighs> troops and millions of innocent civilians in danger. Bitch! Is what there she, she goes. That's and what then she, she said. dropped her mic. She said, get the fuck out of here. And walked <gasps> away. Wow. Or rolled away. She's gone. I love that. She's just angry. And people don't accept her as this, like, angry, fiery Asian woman because that's not yeah. how you're supposed to be. Mm-hmm. She speaks her mind with a sharp tongue At one point, she was asked in an interview what we should do about, like, slave owner statues, kind of like George Washington. And she just says, that's a complex issue, and, like, gives a couple other statements. Tucker Carlson of Fox (laughs) News, D-bag himself, goes on air and says, oh, nobody's allowed to talk about Tammy Duckworth because she's a veteran and she doesn't have legs, but she's a hag (laughs) and an idiot and blah, 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 blah. And, like just goes on Fox news, like talking shit about her and says, she's not a Patriot. She doesn't love this country. What? (laughs) I gave the lower half of my body for this country. What are you talking? And she said she would do it again. (laughs) What? And this is, this is what she said. God, He's the worst. Also, what is he like a fucking rowboat captain of the Yale (laughs) Rowboat team? Who Her the crew? fuck is he? <laughs> Tucker Carlson is like absurd. Ah! I want everybody to watch these interviews where Tucker Tucker Carlson just comes off like a fucking inner like idiot about her. This is throw my not your father's root beer through the window. <laughs> Do you want to know her response? Yes. Actual this is an actual quote. I'm not joking. Fuck Tucker Carlson. <laughs> <laughs> because it's true. <laughs> And she also said, listen, I was in the military for 23 years. I got a mouth on me. Fuck him. 
I Fuck also <laughs> I love that he's taking the stance of like no one is brave enough to <laughs> mock a woman with a disability. But I will do that. I will do that for America. Like <laughs> for America. <laughs> Which is like, well, you know what Tammy Duckworth did for America? Much more than you, actually. Yeah, 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 yeah. Can you fly a, a helicopter, my man? <laughs> oh, okay, my but goodness. then she goes a step further, Katie. In 2018, she becomes the first sitting U.S. senator to give birth while in office. <laughs> so cool. So, <laughs> and then shortly after, she goes to the Senate and brings up this really important resolution. It gets voted on unanimously that any senator that has a baby, if they're under a year old, can bring them on the Senate floor no. during votes. Because you have to pump and you have to be with your baby. And it's like a really long thing. So she, her baby is the first baby on the Senate floor during a vote. I love Ever. That. Ever. And then in 2000, or no, 2020, the Trump administration actually does ask her to be part of this bipartisan task force because she is fairly bipartisan in the way she votes amid the COVID-19 stuff. And she's like, I'm going to be on this. I'm going to be on this task force. So I'm going to let you finish. <laughs> However, there's this guy on it, Barrett, and he's a de- devout Catholic who considers um, IVF to be like Satanist. <laughs> And she conceived both her babies via in vitro and fertilization. Really? Yeah. That's incredible. Both of them. And she's, I mean, she's married to the same guy she was married to in, you know, 1993. Obviously, she's living with a disability. They're both veterans. And she had a baby in 2014 and 2018. But she was like, I think that this man is you know, an insult to all American parents. Like, fuck him for saying that my babies don't exist. Yeah. So that's an issue. Or that she is a heathen for having them. Turns out, currently, she is ranked fifth most effective amongst Democratic senators. And she was just elected, like, two years ago. Oh, my God. She's like the new Patsy Mink, I feel like. Just this person who is doing so much. She's so effective. So effective. She was there participating in the certifying of the Electoral College votes in 2021 when Trump supporters stormed the U.S. Capitol after she called Trump a threat to the nation and called for his immediate removal. Two days after that, she called for the removal of Representative Mary Miller, who quoted Adolf Hitler in a speech. No. <laughs> Yeah. Didn't hear that one. Yeah. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> she was vetted to run as Joe Biden's vice presidential <gasps> candidate, along with women like Kamala Harris. Uh, but when she wasn't selected, she was chosen to serve as the vice chair of the committee for the Democratic National <sighs> Convention. Very cool. She has written her own memoir, but that's not all. Bob Dole. The- <laughs> I heard I may hear his name. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Republican presidential candidate and senator dedicated his autobiography in the beginning to her. What? Why? And she credits him with making her want to run for office. They apparently get along really well in the Senate, (laughs) which that is bipartisan. People work with the other side of the aisle. Like, I we're in an era where like there's so much mudslinging that it's Mm -hmm. insane, but it's not the way it used to be even 10 years ago. Yeah. Like I remember being in high school and people would be like, George W. Bush is crazy, but it's like, he wasn't that crazy. Yeah. He's kind of crazy. Pretty crazy. (laughs) But like he's got opinions I don't agree with, but he's also not like getting people to storm the Capitol. (laughs) There's a big difference. He's not a menace. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) She says that she wakes up every day trying to be worthy of the second chance at life that she was given. And I know. It's going to hit me right in the heartstrings like that. Jesus Christ. And she says when she's asked if she loves America more today than she did when she was a young idealistic kid. She says, of course I do. Because then I thought it was perfect. And now I know it's not. But we're all still fighting for it. (gasps) Oh, my God. <laughs> and that's Tammy so far. I love it. I Sitting also, senator. I'm just going to say, too, I love that quote. And I love her whole personhood because I feel like a lot of, like, 
conservative right wing people <laughs> like they have this idea that like, well, no Democrat loves America. Like Democrats hate America. It's like, no, I fucking and love like, it. No, I fucking love it. And I like want I want America to be America for everyone, not just you. I'm so proud to be here. Let's let's yeah, make it let's a welcome. Make it an actual place for everyone. I want to be a hostess. Yeah, it's exactly. I want to be a hostess. <laughs> I want America to be the Martha Stewart of the fucking world. Yes, please. Like, <laughs> come over. I will have a bouquet of the flowers that are native to your space. Come please. on. It's like, how can you just sit there and say, like, just because you are going to, like, or this is talking about, and this is actually very personal experience. It's like just because you went to the nail salon and got American flags and guns painted on your nails means you love America more than me. Like what the fuck? It's like actually I love this country so much. So like I want other people to feel like at home here. I don't need to wear a tank top that says camo bitches. <laughs> I don't need to swing around my rifle every two seconds <laughs> to like want basic rights for I mean, everyone here or even put metal balls on the back of my yeah. pickup truck <laughs> i don't need to wear crocs to be a real american um just kidding so, people across the aisle wear crocs everybody loves them oh my god nurses um, everywhere bless you and your crocs <laughs> casey's dad joked the other day about because he loves his favorite colors are purple and orange <laughs> and not separately he wears them together all the time He's and the he, he, he literally wears purple <laughs> scrubs and then orange crocs to work every night perfect and he was like he's like you know i i tried to find some orange dress shoes and i just couldn't for the <laughs> wedding and this is a very serious thing and i was like oh you can just wear your orange crocs and he's like oh i could and casey's mom was like no like, <laughs> you will not wear orange crocs to our son's wedding yes <laughs> yes but anyways, uh, <laughs> Mr. Jeff, orange Crocs. <laughs> when you listen to this, never orange Crocs to the wedding. What a blessing, Mr. Jeff he is. Really is. I'm obsessed with him. Okay. okay, we need to talk about these two women, not Mr. Jeff, and a little <laughs> segment we like to call <laughs> Just the Two of Us. So much in common. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. Okay, I. First of all, let's start at the very beginning. It's a very good place to start. These girls grew up fast. They grew up fast, but they also grew up children of a person they thought would leave. <laughs> yes. Zeus and a guy from America. And I know that sounds crazy, but it's very like, I'm the child of this important person. Also, like this important person, like if we're talking about like the white male archetype military in another country, a person who like has a bad reputation of yeah. like yeah. coming over here doing some bad shit and then leaving like Zeus has that reputation in Greek mythology. Like, and I feel like these guys are also like simultaneously bad all the time and then put up on a pedestal. Yeah. And, and then, it's not that every male military no, person no, 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 no. is like, it's the archetype. Well, and it's like not every Greek God is like that. Like not every like man in power is like that. It's like, but you have these examples and you're like, Oh, I know how this is going to go. And I hope it fucking doesn't go that way. Right. And I agree with the super mature statement. That's one thing I wrote down that like as a child, you grew up real fast because your life wasn't going the way you needed it to go. Mm -hmm. And they both had one brother and they both were like, I'm going to take care of my younger brother yeah. and I'm just going to make this happen. Yeah. Which is incredible. It's incredible. And I also, I, I do feel like there's also this kind of defensiveness of the mother that's kind of binding them to mm -hmm. of like, their mothers were people who were almost like looked down upon in society. You know what I'm saying? Like you have this woman who's like, Oh, like that's like a soldier's wife. You and know an over sexualized saying? Asian yeah, woman. Yeah, an over sexualized yes. Asian woman. We have in Lido's case an over sexualized, like, uh, what was she? A tightness. Like just like this yeah. person who was like, you're not quite a God. Yeah. You're a lesser you're than a, kind of like a lesser than God who like, Zeus comes and like does this thing with you and then like there's another man who's like trying to rape you and then like it becomes your children's job to defend you and your choices and then themselves because of that yeah and it's like I think we don't talk often about how like you know like the American dream or whatever is that your children have a better life than you do and now that people are living longer it's like 
I, we are having better lives sometimes. And then we also have to reconcile with our parents' lives. Yeah. And like, now I also have to like go to bat for like, I am going to go to bat for my mom, mm-hmm. you know, in both scenarios. And like, I'm going to talk about the fact that this is a nuanced situation of like, my mother is not from this country. Like my mother grew up in a different culture and like, so did I. And I feel like you see that with Artemis and Apollo of like, our mom is not a lesser woman. She's not Olympian. She's not Olympian, but she's not a lesser woman because she's not an Olympian or because she didn't have 14 kids or because she didn't leave her country to come to America right away. Mm. It doesn't mean she's a lesser person. Right. And I like, I think I also really want to talk about in the same vein of being a lesser person. I think that, the way that Asian women are supposed to be like kind of submissive and Mm -hmm. quiet is the way that you were talking about Artemis, how she's cute, but she's fucking tenacious. Yeah. And I think that's how Tammy Duckworth is. Absolutely. She's like considered this. She even calls herself this cute little Asian woman. How could this cute little Asian woman drive a helicopter? (laughs) But she's like, no, I'm tenacious as fuck. Well, yeah. And that's why like men waltz into Artemis's woods all the time. I'm like, how could this cute, like young goddess, like fuck with me? Like I'm the best hunter in Greece. And she's like, no, the fuck you aren't. I am, Mm -hmm. you know? And I feel like these women are constantly fighting for their place in the world and fighting for their identity of like, Tammy is always like having to be like, no, I am all these things at once. Like, yeah, I am Asian and disabled. Like, and I am like a veteran and I'm all these things. And like Artemis is doing that all the time too of like, yeah, I am the goddess of virginity and childbirth. I know that sounds contradictory, but you know what? It's the fucking fact of the matter because both of these women's <laughs> women's <laughs> love it. They're nuanced as fuck. And they because respect so many women are. And they think and about people. how much they respect war. Yes. Like both of them are very respectful of the idea of like th- sometimes war is a necessary evil. And yeah. let me tell you when. Yeah. And I, I feel like they respect war and they respect like kind of like the weapon. Like I th- was thinking, like, I feel like there's such the a bow and clear... arrow via the helicopter. Yeah. Bow and arrow versus helicopter. King Agamemnon versus gun control. Mm-hmm. It's like, no, like I have my weapon and I'm going to use it like the bow and arrow, the helicopter. And then you have like other people have their weapons. You have King Agamemnon coming into her woods killing a sacred deer and she's like you didn't do it right yeah you're not respecting it and then you have tammy who is like gun control she's like you're not respecting your weapon like loving and respecting is different right like she and i think that's what artemis was saying she's like people who just like love killing and love war Mm. that's something's wrong there the there it's off kilter it's off balance and i feel like that's what tammy is saying she's like don't like love guns like respect guns and like what they do and the purpose they serve well i think that's interesting because the difference between owning a gun and having the responsibility Mm. to own a gun is the way in which you have a background check you go to the gun range you practice you don't just let it sit there you you have a safe you lock it up you don't have it just lying around your house like it's the same way that Artemis was told she needed to go get her bow and arrow. Oh. You don't just get it. You earn it. You earn that shit. Go to Hephaestus and get your fucking arrow. Go to the Cyclops. Get your shit. Go to the gun safety course. Learn how to do it properly. And practice. I, fucking I, practice. Oh, God. I feel like both of these women are like, if you're going to do it, fucking do it right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Uh-huh. And like... I just feel like they are both just so sincerely dedicated to doing things the right way while simultaneously giving people as many options as possible. I'm going to give you the space to make this choice. Yes. Yeah. And I, and again, it's the, it is the weird marriage of war and guns and hunting and love and children and birth and renewal and 
we I feel like they are both goddesses of childbirth and like young children. I feel like they're both fighting for women's rights to make choices about their own bodies. And I think that that's why talking about IVF is so important. Yes, it for, is. For Tammy, she later in life had kids after going through a shit ton and her husband's also a veteran so he went through a shit ton as well so yeah. if you need to get her eggs out and you need to get his sperm out and somehow implant it and you're telling me that your religion says that wrong that's wrong fuck you yeah like fuck you yeah like be the goddess of childbirth like she's carrying this baby yeah she Absolutely. needed a little extra help she's in a fucking wheelchair like let's help her have a baby Let's give women options. That's the whole point. It's like, let's give people options as to how they have children, how they move through the world. Like, I just, I think it's incredible that like, also like, let's give people options as like how they live their romantic and child life. Cause I feel like Artemis maybe would have loved an IVF option because like I said, like I don't she, believe she was aromantic. Like I think she was like, yeah, I like love people so much sometimes. Like and it I love Orion. Hurts. I love Orion. What if we were able to just like have the IVF option and have like just a family where like I'm with my best friend. Right. And like we can do this together and it would be amazing. And like I just – I feel like Tammy's taking the torch from someone like Artemis who also like uses, they think they both use their anger in the right ways too. About like they I are temper. <laughs> they are very clear that like, I am not like a passive submissive woman. Like I am angry. I make mistakes. I yell. I say, fuck you. Like <laughs> I was in the military. I can say, fuck you and smoke a cigarette. Like exactly. get out of here. <laughs> But I also deserve to make my own decisions in my life. And Absolutely. I deserve to, I deserve, I, I am going to make that path accessible for more people. Hmm. And they had the power to do so because these are both very powerful women who yeah. uh, use their influence in such a just massive way. And it's incredible. I think this could have not been a better pairing. No, it really couldn't have been. And I'm also thinking about like, um, how their legacy lives on in statues too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Let me get it all over Turkey and all yeah. over the Daughters of the America Revolution. <laughs> get me that statue. Yes. It's perfect. I love it. All right. So are you ready to toast? I am. Let's toast these two women who have been set to stone. <laughs> <laughs> Allie, who would you like to toast this evening? I just want to toast the modern day profile of courage. Yeah. I, I think that, you know, what Tammy has is like the ideal statute of courage. Mm -hmm. I was blown up in war. I have my PhD. I'm a mom. I'm a Senator. But I think that, you know, sometimes getting out of bed is courage when you know, yeah. you're about to have a hard day. I know like dealing with life when you can't pay your bills or you can't feed your children is courage when you're having a bad day or like even getting up and going to school or to work when you know you have a big test or a big meeting. So just the profile of modern day courage is so important. And just being courageous in little moments means so much to not only you and your mental health, mm -hmm. but also the people living in your home. Yeah. And the way they see you react to things. Now, you're allowed to break down, and you should be allowed to break down. Absolutely. Especially in front of the people you love. But little moments of courage is what I want to toast. Perfect. The tiny ones. Cheers. <laughs> the ones we all deserve and that I need desperately. <laughs> okay. What are you going to toast? I'm going to toast women who don't compromise on their love life. I think throughout history... There have been lesbian, asexual, aromantic, bisexual people who have been forced into relationships that they aren't comfortable with. Mm. And I just appreciate that Artemis was so adamant about what she wanted and what she didn't want. Mm. And I want to toast to that. Cheers. Cheers. She knows what's up. She does. <sighs> All right. Allie, what are you enjoying in pop culture this week? Katie, there is this <laughs> on Disney Plus. There's this adorable short called 20 something. 20 something. Okay. And it's like five to eight minutes long. 
and it is these like amazing black women who are sisters and the older sister is taking her younger sister who just turned 21 to the bar for the first time. (laughs) And the younger sister is having an internal monologue and is dealing with herself as a baby, herself as a preteen and herself as a teenager all at the same time. Oh my God. <laughs> and is like ending up crying in the bathroom and her older sister has to come in and get her. And mm. you just see her combine all these moments in her life to this one powerful woman. Yeah. And it is so, so beautiful. That sounds incredible. It's, and it, I mean, in eight minutes, you're like, I absolutely see. Yeah. How important it is that everybody's living in their brain because then there's a moment towards the end where everybody in the bar slowly is turning into 12 year olds and you're looking around and you're like everybody feels in their head like it's not just me I feel like that was like such the beauty of like inside out yeah where it was like everyone has these crazy things going on in their head that like you know, there's, like, other things affecting people than just, like, what you can see from the outside. Yeah. And I think it's great. It's really sweet. And I would heavily suggest looking up 20-something. It's probably on YouTube at this point. It's only... Yeah, eight minutes long. Yeah. That's perfect. It is um, beautiful. I love it. Producer and I watched it, and we were like, this was totally worth it. Great. <laughs> what do you got? Okay, so I'm going to recommend a book that I just finished, and fiance Casey had read on vacation so it was dark places by Jillian Flynn so Ugh. now I've read all three of her books I love if there's Jillian another one Flynn. let me know um it was so good she's because absurd. she's an absurd person she she's so talented yeah. and I love that she in this book kind of takes the true crime fanatic world and kind of turns it on its head and like So, like, the basic plot of the book is, like, there's this girl that survived the murder of her entire family when she was a child. Oh, absurd. And then you see her being thrown into the lion's den of a bunch of internet conspiracy true crime people. And I, I, and this is all, like, this is all in the very beginning, so I'm not, like, spoiling anything, but it is heart palpitating her going in to meet these people and there was like a, the don't fuck with cats people. Exactly. Yeah. And there was a girl who has the main character's picture on her notebook. She's like, that's my elementary school photo. And she's drawn like devil horns on it because she's like, you, I did the wrong killer. And she's like, I was a child. Like, what the fuck? Like, you know, it is, it's so great, especially coming off of my last couple recommendations of like only murders in the building and then bear brook murders of like where does true crime fascination and interest take us and how does it affect uh, the whole book i feel like the point of it was like how does it affect the people who actually the crime happened to right you know and like at what point are we helping at what point are we hurting like oh i love that in that hotel show what's the hotel show that just came out about that hotel in la oh yes i know exactly what you're talking about yeah well in that one like the people who are accused of this murder that Mm -hmm. like didn't do it their lives were like fucking destroyed yeah and then you have this person in this book whose life life was destroyed i mean her whole family was murdered right and then people yelling at her and being like you're a bad person and she's like what like (laughs) Yeah. It's a great book. It's so well written. Twists and turns all over the place. I mean, Gillian Flynn loves a twist. She loves a twist. And a turn and then a somersault. <laughs> <laughs> so Dark Places by Gillian Flynn. It's so good. Um, yeah. So you can find us anywhere. Please do. Uh, we have so many social media accounts. We have <laughs> a patron, which we'll talk to you guys in a minute. Oh, yeah. If you want to see what we talk about after the episode yeah. join us on patreon if you want to see katie taking pictures of cocktails on top of a toilet oh my <laughs> god that did happen and i won't tell patreon. you when but it's on patreon <laughs> everybody <laughs> loves it um but yeah we love you there um we're starting to gear up for our fall gift uh and i am 
so excited that you guys are listening and giving us, so, we, I mean, our no, novel, true novel of recommendations. Yes. It's so great. We're getting more messages. Um, I, oh gosh, I'm just so excited about all of it. Um, and we also, we would really appreciate it if you rated and reviewed us on Apple podcast. That is one of the big ways we like see support or criticism or whatever um, is through the reviews, um, preferably support because I have a fragile ego, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it'll be great. And we love you and follow us everywhere. We post every recipe on Tuesday before the episode comes out. So if you want to drink with us, like Miss Krista does, shout mm -hmm. out to Miss Krista. <laughs> follow us on Instagram and Twitter and everything. And never forget that well-behaved women uh, are always a part of the American Revolutionary Daughters. <laughs> <laughs> and then sometimes Tammy Duckworth. The Globe. All right. Atlas. I don't know what that means. <laughs> I feel like that scene. And <laughs> so I just knocked a globe over with my hair bun. <laughs> And I feel like I am what's her face in the movie with Britney Spears Crossroads. Crossroads. Do you remember when she falls yeah. down the stairs and like loses her baby and she drops her keychain yeah. that has a little globe and then on she's it? She's like, they told me I lost my baby. Like it's a set of keys or something that sticks with me. That's a moment. That moment has affected me for the rest of my life. Okay. Goodbye. Goodbye. <laughs> Okay. All right. I have to pee really quick before well, we get started on this. Let's do it. Let's do it. I'm glad we ended that one. You've been listening to Her Story on the Rocks. We are independently produced by 1986 Entertainment and proudly recorded in Baltimore, Maryland. If there's a woman in history you would like us to cover, you can email us at herstoryontherocks at gmail.com. You can also message us on Twitter or Instagram. We post all of our cocktail recipes on Tuesdays so that you can go get all the supplies you need and drink along with us. See you next week. Bye.